All right, so we're going to talk about if Uber and Lyft ads are actually viable and if Walmart ads are viable, if Target ads are viable, right? So I'm going to pull off from this Wall Street Journal piece. Neil, did you check this one out yet or no? I haven't read the article, but I do know people who advertise on Lyft and Uber. Yep. So let's talk about this. Basically in, in recent, so basically Lyft, Uber, Walmart, CVS, Kroger, DoorDash, they've all opened kind of advertising businesses, right? And they're all growing right now. Some numbers to share here. So we passed $500 million in annual run rate for ad sales. And that's based on the increasing number of active advertisers that we have by 80% on a year on year basis. Uber chief executive Dara cannot pronounce last name said on a call to discuss company earnings. More than 315,000 businesses ran ads with Uber in the fourth quarter, nearly double the company's 170,000 plus advertisers a year earlier. Uber sees more opportunity for growth given that only 25% of the companies selling products through Uber Eats are buying ads on a platform. Uber is still targeting 1 billion annual ad revenue by 2024. What are your thoughts? I, I, it's a very viable model. The reason it's growing is we know quite a few people that are running ads on Uber. If you're a local business, it's amazing. It can drive a lot of traction. We haven't really seen great results for companies that are global or national. We've seen really good results for local businesses from it. It helps drive in foot traffic. Like a great example of this is a gym or a restaurant. We're seeing it work really well for those kind of things. Because you have to remember, Uber is city-based, right? And so is Lyft. So when someone's using it, if an ad is very relevant for the place they're in right now, it's much more likely to work from what we've seen than when it's a global product. And especially if it's appealing, if you see an ad being like LA's best pizza, and then someone says, oh, I'm visiting LA, I'm in Uber, let me check out the best pizza. We found that to be more effective than being like Wayfair, the best place to buy furniture. It's like we see people taking much more action from these ads from Uber and Lyft when it is localized versus when it is national or global. I think this is interesting because so for us, we have a couple of really well-known just chains, right? Restaurant chains around the world. If I said the name, you guys would all know it. I think this is interesting because we actually did a podcast maybe a year or two ago on talking about how we believe that everything is becoming an ad network. And that comes from a blog post that I read. And so if you actually have the volume, it actually makes sense for you to run ads. Netflix is running ads too, right? And so we're seeing it where not all the power is consolidated with Meta or Alphabet anymore, right? It's Google, I should say. It's still Google, it's still, and it's Meta on the other side. But I'm just looking at the numbers here. Like whenever a new ad platform comes out, the costs are generally cheaper. When Google ads first came out in the very beginning, you were paying like maybe like pennies when it came to bidding on really expensive keywords. Could be finance related or insurance related keywords, right? Now, I'm looking at the numbers here. So it says Lyft charges $2 for every thousand impressions. So $2 CPM while Uber charges $5 for 1000 impressions for a comparable product. So now's the time. If you are local, it does make sense to give this a shot. You don't really have much to lose anyway. And then Uber also charges $45 per 1000 impressions for in-app ads, right? So you have the, by the way, the first thing I was talking about was the rooftop display ones, right? So you, let's say you're driving an Uber, there's actually like an ad on top of it. So they're going to have different products. And I would say, forget about just Uber or Lyft for a second. Like I just mentioned earlier, there's Walmart, there's Target, there's Kroger's, right? Everyone's trying to figure out how to drive more revenue from their business. And everyone's trying to be more efficient, especially with the world that we are living in now. I think we're both saying right here, it's worth a test. And we'll report back from both of our companies in the next couple months on how we actually think this stuff is going. Neil, anything else? Local business, you should try it out. It's not that expensive and it's driving great ROI. We are now going to talk about what we learn from a Miami founders mastermind. Kent, this mastermind was actually a one that I hosted in Miami a week ago. Neil and I, we hung out and there's a lot of great people there. And I'll kick it off with the kind of the high level on how the mastermind looks. And then I'm actually going to hear from Neil's perspective as an attendee. So this group is called leveling up founders, and it's a group of anywhere from seven to eight to nine figure founders that we try to get together twice a year. And so one event is in LA, one is in Miami. And the key thing for me is just connecting really high caliber people and just continuing to up the caliber of the group. The way we do this event is that we all get in one hotel, we go, not at one hotel room, but we all go to one hotel spot. We, and then there's a, there's like a conference room area. And then there's also, there, there's just, there's breakfast and then there's great people. There's great speakers as well. But the most important thing for this event is always the people. So we decided to take a big risk on this event and we used a unconference format, meaning that 
we didn't just fly everyone, like everyone flew in from all these different places to just watch like a couple of talking heads speak. We actually had people from the group, the attendees themselves, because they're also very accomplished. They spoke and then we did a lot of breakout rooms, right? And so we changed out the format this time. And I was actually very scared that this event would not be able to top the Beverly Hills event that I did in August, but I believe that it actually did. So I'm going to pause for a second and let Neil add it and I'll give some more context around the event. Go ahead, Neil. So I've been to quite a few of Eric's masterminds and I gave him real honest feedback after this one. And I was like, I'm like, dude, I've been going to your masterminds for a little bit now. And I have to say the quality of the attendees is a lot better. And what I mean by that financially, yeah, a lot of them are doing much better than the previous ones, but the knowledge that they're bringing was much more valuable than the previous ones. And I told Eric. I remember when he was doing these masterminds, call it six months ago. I, I don't know if you remember. I was like, no, nah, I don't know how many of them I'm going to go to. I got a family. Yeah. And I, Neil was getting a little shaky. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty much like, I don't think I'm going to end up going to too many more of these. And after the Miami one, I was like, wow, these are great. You should do more of them like this. And the key is it's not really who's on stage speaking. It's actually all about the attendees. If the attendees are from different industries, have different businesses, and they're successful and they're generating income, it's much easy to learn from them because everyone has different types of businesses and they're in different sectors. So they all have different experiences and different things that works in their industry that may not work in your industry or vice versa, or things that could work in their industry or have been working in their industry and no one in your industry has tried it out. It, it, in other words, it was such a nice melting pot of different people from different industries. I really felt like I learned a lot. For example, someone in there was a creative shop. They talked about, to me at least, uh, how to end up cranking out creatives really fast. Someone in there was about health and living really long. And they were just like, oh, you can end up testing your internal clock and seeing how long you could potentially end up living. And that gentleman was Jacob. And I was just like, oh, this is really cool. I'm going to end up getting this done. And funny enough, we were texting the other day. He's like, oh, I'll do the first one free. I'm like, no, I don't really care for a free. I'll pay for it. And I was like, I would love to do this for my whole family and I. But the reason I think all this is really cool is you're learning a lot of different things from different people who are really successful within their space. While in Eric's previous events, a lot of them were just agency owners. And they were just talking about how to run their agencies. And they're like, oh, this is cool. I already got an agency. I'm not really learning anything new. What was really valuable for them was I'm making an assumption here. I'm guessing my agency was probably larger than all of the other people's agencies. So they're more so learning from me, but this was one of the first events that Eric has thrown that I really loved it so much because I came away learning a lot of things outside of what I do. Cool. I'll just thank you for that, Neil. I didn't pay Neil to say that, by the way. The way we set this up, again, it's a, it's more of an unconference format, right? And so it's very much based on the people. And I looked at the survey results on how this one went. So the last event was a 9.7. This one was a 9.72. And again, it's what did you like the most? And like 99% of people people said the people. And so we're just going to keep leveling up the quality of the group and keeping it in an intimate environment. But we try to have a lot of change ups for people. So instead of just having people sit in the room the whole time, it's like, okay, what activities can we do? So this time we drove a little far to do top golf, a little too far, a little too far, but that's going to change next time. We got feedback on that. We have the breakouts, right? So it's like, imagine instead of it's just Neil and I talking, it's like you have people in the group getting together in a round table. They're all sharing knowledge. Right. And one thing that I learned from someone in the group is that they use something that's that, that might be like a little under the radar right now on how you can basically collect 30 to 40% of your visitors, like in, onto your email list. I'm not going to talk about what that is right now because I find it a little questionable still, but you learn these things. Right. And then we have our growth tax. So let's say. You know, someone in the group might talk for 15 minutes and share something on wellness. Someone might share something on sleep. Someone might share something on something that worked well in marketing or like something that worked well in sales. Right. And then we have dinners and things like that. All right. So let's talk about the app tracking transparency recession. I'm going to describe what it is first, and I'm going to kick it over to Neil. So app tracking transparency recession. So what that means is this, I was reading a blog post. I believe it was Ben Thompson from statutory. I'm not even pronouncing that, but he actually cited a blog post on this whole concept of, Hey, like the recession that we've seen from these big tech companies, like meta, for example, when it dropped like 50 ish percent or so 60 ish percent, maybe total for 2022. Is that about, I think that's about right. So 
he, his argument is like, we're not in a real recession right now for the economy, but there has been a recession in the world of tech, which is why you see the meta's laying off a bunch of people. Snap has laid off a bunch of people as well. Right. And so the argument here is that when Apple made its changes, the iOS changes, where it basically made it opt in, opt out for tracking, it basically ruined the world for, especially for Facebook, right? So if you're like a social platform, like an Instagram or a Facebook or like a Snap, what's happened to your business is that your stock has basically tanked a ton, right? Whereas if you look at Amazon's business, their Amazon ad business, it actually hasn't tanked a ton. And then when you look at like Google search, for example, it hasn't tanked a ton, right? But the ones that are social ads, the social platforms that they have tanked a ton, and that's the app tracking transparency, the ATT recession that's actually happened, which is why you've seen the stocks decline um, quite heavily, right? Whereas when you look at Autodesk or these other platforms or outdoor ad platforms, they haven't tanked a lot and search hasn't tanked a lot. So. I think that's interesting because the argument here is that's the first wave of a recession and we haven't seen the economy be crushed yet. So we might see more coming. Well, what's funny, a lot of the reasons that apps aren't doing as well is also because of sizing and privacy data, right? The iOS changes have made it so much harder for app companies to actually get installs through paid advertising compared to what they were used to exactly. able to get. And you fast forward to 2024, Google is rolling out similar changes, which is going to hit Facebook all over again. You mean the cookies? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So, so it's like, when you think about apps, yeah, they're struggling. And when you think about the rest of the economy, I'm no economist. I don't know if we're in a recession or not. As an ad agency, we see marketing budgets cut first, typically before any other departments. And What's a little bit different from this recession versus previous ones, companies are getting ahead of it and they're starting to cut before bad things happen in their eyes, just in case. But to start of the year for 2023, we've seen companies actually spend more money on marketing than they did in previous quarters or months, at least from the RFPs and the small set of data that we're getting. A lot of companies are actually looking to ramp up their spend. Yep. We don't know. How, I will say like on your side or my side too, we, like, we don't know how much longer that's going to stick, but we're going to roll with the punches and just continue yep. to be cautious. Cause that's all you can really do at the end of the day. There's no sense in trying to predict and over index too much on one side or the other. No, there's no point in doing any of that, but it's right now for your businesses. Look for opportunities. Yes. A lot of people are fearful, but that doesn't mean that you can't actually grow your marketing and do it profitably, even in a bad economy, people are still spending money. Maybe they're spending less, but they're still spending money. If you look at the inflation report for January, it was actually much better. Yeah, it was much better than they expected. In other words, inflation was much stronger than they predicted. You mean worse? Cause it got worse. Yeah, it was technically yeah. worse. So inflation yeah. was much worse than they predicted, which caused the stock market to go down because people thought inflation was coming down, but based on the January numbers, not so much and spending was really strong. I just think we're going to see more headwinds, right? If I'm Apple, I'm building my own ad business. Of course, I'm going to add in these things to make it harder for my competition, right? And be like, yep. privacy is really important, right? And then you have headwinds coming in from Google saying, we're going to remove cookies, right? They have to favor themselves as well. But then the, the silver lining here is that it's going to force marketers to be more creative. Like we've talked about this quite a bit. It's like maybe two, three years ago, you could just raise a bunch of money and then dump it into meta and dump it into Google and you're good to go. I'm oversimplifying, but now it's okay. How can you be more creative? How can you make sure that you have better reporting that tells a better story on how you can guide your marketing but in the last maybe two episodes ago we talked about lyft ads uber ads walmart ads doordash ads target ads right podcast ads all these different types of ads like newsletter ads i think it's time to be more creative and what neil just talked about with inflation i believe and you can quote me what we'll come back to this clip maybe in a couple of years i think we're going to have four, five, 6% interest rates for the next decade. So maybe into 2033, and I, we've come into this new sea change, which is what investor Howard Marks talks about. And when interest rates are higher, that means the risk-free rate, and I don't want to go too much into um, finance here, investing here, but that means that when you are basically putting money into like bonds, for example, you're going to automatically get a return. So just the way people invest money and then the way people like invest money into tech stocks, the way people borrow money for businesses to, to buy ads or whatever, that's all going to change quite a bit. Anything else, Neil? Yeah. The last thing that I would add is because of what's happening with all the tracking and privacy changes around the whole web, you're actually going to see a surge in AI for AI analyzing data and analytics and telling you what to do and creating more informed decisions. The reason I say this, and it's really important in marketing is 
your leverage is going to be going after the low hanging fruit and all the opportunities, but most people aren't using their BI tools or analytics tools. And you could say you are, cause you have them, but how many people actually log in on a regular basis, look at reports and then come up with actionable things that they should do within their marketing based on their learnings. Very few. And I think that's going to be a huge area where AI is going to help because of all these changes that are happening as well, which should help you grow faster, especially when times are bad. Yeah. And look, the final thing I'll say is this, we've talked quite a bit about diversifying and building your brand and using organic social or using dark social, whatever you want to call it. And we think this is going to be, become a bigger and bigger thing. And those that can differentiate themselves in addition to running ads are going to be able to win for the long term. I'll give you one final thing. Like we have one retailer. Okay, everyone knows who this client is. And I asked them at the very end of the call. So usually I don't hop in the client calls on the single grain side. And I just decided to hop in. I was like at the very end. So I just was listening to the very end and I was like, okay, forget about everything that we just said right now. Okay. Cause it was like a SEO CRO client, right? I was like, forget about everything that we just said. Hope you enjoyed it. What is it going to take in the next 12 months for us to hit a home run for you? And then they said, we would really like to do more UGC TikTok content. And then we would really like someone to help us grow our executives brands on LinkedIn. And that's where the puck is going. And so I encourage you, if you are, whether it's client services or in your product business, you should be talking to your customers and asking, what's it going to be for us to hit a home run? What do we need to do to help you get there? What are your challenges right now? So it's a sense of ongoing customer development because needs are going to continue to change, especially in this new environment. Anything else, Neil? Nope. That's it. All right, so let's talk about how the best marketers manage their most important resource, which is time. And I will go first on this one because, by the way, we're only talking about this because time is your most important asset, right? Because it cannot be renewed, whereas money can be renewed. So the very first thing that I do that's actually pretty neurotic, I think there's a 25% chance that Neil does this, is every quarter or so, or maybe every half year or so, I actually create a timesheet and I look at every hour, how I spend every hour. And so for this hour, for example, or this 30 minutes or yeah, this hour, actually we're recording this podcast. And so I might note for this one, did this task actually give me energy or did it take it away? So I would mark it in a green highlight if it gave me energy or a red highlight if it took energy away from me. I'll also have another column that has $4 signs, right? It could be anywhere from $1 sign to $4 signs. So $4 signs is it makes me a lot of money. $1 sign is it doesn't make me that much money at all. So what happens is I'm going to basically do this for doing this manually, by the way, you might say, oh, there's this time tracking tool. I, I use all the tools, right? But point is you do it manually. And as you're writing it down, you're starting to get a sense for like how you're actually spending your time. I would recommend that you do this for two weeks. You're not going to be able to track every single thing, but you could be you'll probably be able to track about 80% of it. And then after two weeks, you can review how you spent your time, what things you actually want to delegate, what gave you energy, what didn't get the things that don't give you energy off your plate, get the low dollar earning things off your plate as well, unless it's like hanging out with your family or your friends. But that's how you want to think about how you can optimize your time. What I'm actually going to do now after I, Neil and I are actually traveling on Sunday, but when I come back next week, I'm going to actually record it in 15 minute increments. And I actually got that from a mutual friend, Dan Martell. Go ahead, Neil. So the big thing that I do to control my time is, and I actually just do one simple thing. We have a mutual friend named Yaniv. They have a company called Nextiva, which is a phone service company. If you haven't checked them out, you should. They've done an amazing job, a multiple billion dollar unicorn before they ever raised their first dollar of money. And they've done an amazing job of marketing. And I remember Yaniv telling me years and years ago, the best way to be efficient and really manage your time is to use an iPad. And I don't think Eric really follows that too much. Correct, I do. Eric? I use oh, my do. iPad. Yeah. But I live and breathe and die by it in which I try to use my iPad for everything. If I can't, if I need a computer because I can't use my iPad for something, that means I'm not delegating enough. And that has saved me so much time and it allows me to focus on what's really important. Now, there are some times where I can't use my iPad. For example, recording this podcast, it's not really efficient to record a podcast episode from an iPad. It's also not really that efficient to do webinars from an iPad. So there's a few things like that where I don't use the iPad, but for the majority of the things that I do, I use the iPad every single day. And I try to only use my laptop maybe once or twice 
Yeah. By the way, just to double down on that a little more. So I actually made, it's funny. I made a YouTube video that actually did well years and years ago. This is like three, four years ago, actually on how the iPad is the ultimate business tool. Here's why it's the, we think it's the ultimate business tool. The reason for that is because it forces you to focus. You can't do the other stuff. You can't just start to get really distracted by a bunch of other tabs. Whereas on my computer, I'm actually a lot more efficient and I'm a lot faster. Same thing for Neil, but on the iPad, it's just, you're straight up just doing emails. You're straight up delegating things. And it's more of a privileged thing to say, but if you can get to that level where you do have a team that's helping you, whether it's contractors or full-time people, the iPad is actually going to help you focus in more and lock it, especially if you're in a world where it's a lot of communication in terms of getting things done. It's a lot of assigning things. We're aware that this doesn't apply to every single marketer out there or every single entrepreneur case by case basis. But I, both Neil and I have our MacBooks and we both have our iPads and we have our desktops, but I generally use the iPad when I'm traveling because I'm locked in more. Neil? What will you take with you to Dubai when we leave both. tomorrow? You'll take both. both. Same here. Yeah. Because yep. for me, like when I'm making PowerPoint presentations for marketing, it is hard to do on an iPad. But for most of the things, I will just use the iPad. Yep. All right. So those are two things that you can do. You can track your time hardcore. There's the iPad piece. You just had, you just need to relentlessly protect your time. Actually, what, one more thing here. Um, there are different seasons here. You'll see people talk about how they have nothing on their calendar, nothing scheduled, or you have people talk about how they have everything scheduled. And then you have people that will just in the middle, they'll have the time block. For example, this podcast is a time block. Neil and I try to make an hour or two every one or two weeks or so. So we try to, we try to theme our days sometimes, right? So Thursdays for me, at least are content days. Fridays are no meeting days for me. Mondays, I jam all my meetings. It just depends on the season of business that you're in. And then in some cases, like for example, I don't know about you, Neil, Neil, are you still calendar open right now, but you're just heavily calling people, talking to your team a bit? Yeah. My calendar is always pretty open. I try not to schedule too many calls and interviews on a daily basis, which then gives me a lot more time to be efficient as a marketer and actually get work done. I think a big mistake that most marketers make is they try to have their calendars with back-to-back -back calls. And if your calendar is full of calls and meetings, how much time are you actually spending getting stuff done? Yep. Last thing on, on this, I think Neil and I are both component proponents of 15 minute calls. So if people try to schedule calls, I generally try to make it 15 minutes, especially if I don't know the person. And if I don't know what the call is about, I always ask like, if, especially if I don't know the person, Hey, Neil, great to hear from you. What's the preview of the call so I can be most helpful. And most of the time you could actually solve the problem right there in the email. And then if they, you do get on call, it's only 15 minutes because people would like Parkinson's law, you'll fill the time. If you're given more time, I will say one caveat to that is if you do have direct reports. I generally hold the, my one-on-ones with my direct report sacred because I'm there to be there for them. And I try to, I would prefer those to be 30 minutes. I do try to meet with other people sometimes that are not my direct reports and maybe those are 15 minutes. So just keep in mind, everything we're saying is not sacred. You might have to adjust based on your mileage. So your mileage may vary. All right. So let's talk about how digital marketing will change in 2023 and beyond. So in the last couple of episodes, we've talked about the app tracking transparency recession. So we're saying how like things, Apple companies like Apple and Google are making things harder for social apps like Facebook, right? From a tracking perspective for apps to grow as well. And then we're, there's actually the proliferation of ad platforms on like DoorDash, on Uber, on Lyft, on Walmart, on Target. So digital advertising is changing quite a bit. And also there's the dark social. There's a lot more post people posting to organic social or dark social, whatever you want to call it. So those are just a couple of things, but we want to outline things a little more here and then consolidate it into one episode. Neil, you want to go first? Yeah, I think the big thing that's going to change is companies are going to have no choice but to spend a lot more on data and analytics with there being so many channels that you have to use and with tracking not being as good as it used to with the privacy changes that Apple rolled out as well as that Google will eventually roll out in 2024. You're going to need the insights. The way you make your marketing a lot better is you look at the data, you figure out what to do next, where there's a low hanging fruit and opportunity, you go and execute on that. But if the data is really inaccurate and you're analyzing bad data, you can end up making terrible decisions in your marketing and that can cost your arm and a leg. So you're going to see a companies make a bigger investment in data analytics. They don't have a choice. And you're also going to see companies use AI to help analyze a lot of that data. And this is important because we see companies looking at their analytics, but we very rarely see them taking actions based on the data in the analytics. So I think that's going to change heavily in 2023 because people are going to get ready for next year with the Google changes. 
The other thing that we're seeing is companies are actually pushing really heavily on their employees marketing the business for them. So if you think about big corporations, what do they have? Lots of employees, even small, mid-sized, they have lots of employees. What are all their employees on? Social media. Why can't they use their followers to help promote the product and the service that they're building or working on within that organization? And we're seeing a lot of companies make this push because it's free marketing. It's a great way to get more sales and more customers because you have all these loyal people that work for you and love the brand or hopefully love the brand. The other thing that we're really seeing in 2023 is companies trying to figure out their own channels. So what I mean by this is it used to be that we mainly see companies relying heavily on Google and Facebook. And yes, there's channels like SMS and email and push notifications that are effective and you have much more control over, but no one really, or the majority of the companies that we see and we're working with and that we talk to really leverage those channels. And the main reason for that is they're just like, oh, Google ads work, it's easily scalable and same with Facebook ads. But because a lot of these changes that are happening with how much you can actually spend due to the tracking not being as good, companies are actually realizing that oh, wow, we need to be in more control of our destiny. Yes, everyone's talked about Omnichannel, but a lot of these other platforms, whether it's Snap or Reddit or Pinterest, will have some of the same issues due to the tracking and privacy changes. So we need to start creating our own channels and being in control of our own destiny. In other words, email, it's easier to control that. It's easier to control a podcast. It's easier to control your own blog. It's easier to control your push notification list or your text list. These are all things that we see companies investing heavily in, in 2023, especially on the podcasting side, because it's just so much untapped potential. All right. So look on my side, you know, what's interesting. I was reading that there's someone that shares their income when it comes to podcasting. And I was looking at it and what's interesting to me is that the revenue has been flat, especially the last three, four five years or so. But it also tells me- Who shares that, their income publicly? Yeah, publicly. I'm assuming um, you're talking about- JLD. Either, yeah, John Lee Dumas or Pat from Smart Passive Income. I don't Pat, doesn't, Pat hasn't shared it for years, but JLD does. And I, I still appreciate the fact that he does, even though we've talked about the, the how we wouldn't. That's um, Entrepreneurs on Fire for anyone who's correct. Uh, wondering. So if everyone can search out. Entrepreneurs on Fire Income Report. What I find interesting is that he's done well for himself, right? The fact of the matter is that his podcast revenue has been very consistent over the last couple of years. And to me, it just seems like an annuity. And I actually think it's going to get even stronger for him in the next couple of years as more people come on because it was just announced that podcasts are coming to YouTube music. So we're going to see hopefully more discoverability there, but I digress. In addition to what Neil is saying, I think we're going to see a proliferation of more content, right? And so that means more content on blogs. And so what we're doing for this podcast right now for marketing school is we're actually figuring out how we can combine editors with chat GPT somehow, and then just pump out more written content and then leverage kind of the domain authority that we have, and then be able to rank higher. Cause we, we typically will be more on top of trends than we are, than our editorial teams are. And we're, so we're trying to figure out how we can get the trending topics out there faster. Right? So that's one of the things, and that's why we're trying to grow faster on YouTube. So go subscribe to us on YouTube marketing school. I. Even though we're talking about more content for SEO, it's like, how does that apply to advertising? Well, you're going to have more data to collect emails. You're going to have more data where you can retarget people, right? Even though that's a, that's a little harder now. Now, I believe we're also going to see more M&A for attention. So people buying attention, right? So we've talked about this before. People buying sites that are maybe underutilized or under monetized or people that are just struggling and maybe they've leveraged our company too much and they need to maybe sell out. I think we're going to see more partnerships too. Neil, I don't, I don't know if you met my friend Jeffrey at the Mastermind, but he's partnered with Jake Paul, who's actually boxing in 45 minutes here in Saudi Arabia. We're going to go tomorrow, but we're going to miss it. But so main point I'm Wait, saying who's is he that boxing in Saudi Arabia. No, we, we could have popped over there. It would have been an hour for us. But I know I'm saying who's he boxing. In oh, Saudi? Uh, Tyson Fury's brother. Tommy Fury. No yeah, he's, he's like a heavyweight champion or something, but he's boxing the brother. Point is, you're partnering with people that have the attention. You're partnering with people that have this audience. It's the same thing with the, we'll talk about Mr. Beast, right? He's got the audience already. He's got the attention. And then there's a handful of people that are partnered up with him. And I think we're going to see more of a proliferation, not just on SEO type content, but also on social content, right? People building their audiences that way and then using that leverage to grow. And one thing I want to add to what Neil is saying. 
on people having their employees help market a company too. I've seen an ad agency do this. A client boost actually does this and they have their employees post and they all, they all engage with the posts as well. So then it gets more reach. And so I think they do a good job of it because they actually train their team on how to do it. And their team seems like they're bought in on it. So I think that's a good example. If you want to emulate someone, anything else, Neil? Nope. That's it. All right. So let's talk about how Warren Buffett has a $130 billion cash hoard and what it basically tells us as marketers. So I'm pulling up a text message that I sent to my mom this morning because we were talking about investing yesterday when I saw her. So the headline here is Berkshire Hathaway fourth quarter operating earnings fall 8% as cash hoard swells to nearly 130 billion. So Berkshire Hathaway is Warren Buffett's, it's his holding company. He's partnered with Charlie Munger. These guys are in their mid nineties. They don't need any more money. They just love playing the game. Warren Buffett eats McDonald's every day and drinks Coke. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think the same thing too, because I watched so many of his documentaries and I was like, man, I'm like, this guy eats really unhealthy and I've never in any of the documentaries, I've never really seen him exercise or anything like that. No, and he's just like, he's just he's enjoying like, what he does and he just continues to live. And my mom's like, it's unfair that he gets to live for so long, but we digress. So we want to talk about because of happiness. He's really happy in what he does and in life, which probably helps. I think they're both content. They're not, they don't complain or anything and they're just good uncles, right? So look, he's got this $130 billion cash hoard. I think last year it was a 122 billion. So that's cash that he's holding right now. And we want to explain how to think about it as business owners and marketers, because keep in mind, I just mentioned that his earnings declined by 8% in Q4 of 2022. Yes. Yeah, the big thing it tells Eric and I is there's a lot of opportunity out there. If he believed that right now was the right time to strike and things were at a good price, he would go and start deploying a lot of that money. It's not that they don't want to deploy the money. It's not that they want to have all this cash just sitting in a bank account. They don't want that. The issue is the timing isn't right in which I've seen him talk about on TV. It's a lot of times he doesn't try to time things for a down economy or a bad economy. He's saying that's very hard to. But what you need to do is look for good businesses at a reasonable price. And he's struggling to find them just like most people are. Hence, he has a lot of cash on his balance sheets. It's also the same reason why a lot of companies have a lot of cash on the balance sheets, which means chances are things are going to get worse over the next 12 months. If they weren't and they thought, hey, this is the worst time, they'd probably be deploying a lot of the money right now. Yeah. We've often shared on this podcast, some of the kind of lessons from Warren Buffett, right? So be greedy when others are fearful and be, be greedy when others are fearful and be fearful when others are greedy. Right. And so it's still a moment. It's not necessarily that people are necessarily greedy right now. It's the prices, right? So the economy is very shaky right now. And what usually happens, the way you make your wealth is that you wait for not just good companies. So good companies is Benjamin Graham. That's his mentor, right? Charlie Munker who's partnered with Warren Buffett said, dude, let's just focus on great companies, buying them at great prices. To, to Neil's point, the prices aren't great right now. We're waiting for the earnings multiples to start to drop. But the fact that Berkshire's earnings came down a little bit, I think we're starting to see the dominoes fall, right? We're seeing a lot of tech layoffs. And I think we're going to start to see investment bankers start to lose their bonuses as well. And then I think we're going to see Main Street layoffs. So that's all we hope it doesn't happen. But the fact of the matter is you look at this guy, he's been through so many recessions. It's telling us that he is loading up and to, for you as a marketer, you as a business person, there's an opportunity for you to load up as well. We highly recommend that you check out the last episode where we talk about opportunities to potentially buy stuff. Yeah, and, and this doesn't mean that you need to go and buy a business or go borrow money from an account and go all in. It, it could just be when times get tougher, marketing costs go down and you can end up arbitraging money or spend a little bit more on paid ads and generate more sales and gobble up more market share. So the playbook that you could follow doesn't have to be Warren Buffett's playbook or Charlie Munger's or anyone else's. You could just invest more into your business. So a great example of this is a lot of agencies are pulling back. A lot of them are doing massive layoffs. A lot of companies are pulling back on their budget. And Eric knows this because I was in Miami with him a few weeks ago. We're hiring faster and faster for international expansion. We had Germany kick off. We had Singapore kicking off in 30 days. So that'll get us in eight regions. We're putting out an offer to someone to run per Portugal for us. We're putting out an offer sometime this week for someone to run Spanish speaking LATAM for us because we already have someone for Brazil. So that'll add around four more countries that will expand into with Latin America. And we're looking for France, Italy, 
and a few other regions at the moment, as well as Spain, Netherlands, UAE, Malaysia. In other words, what I'm getting at is we're doubling down right now because we see a massive opportunity overseas and creating a global company while our competition is focusing on weathering the storm. But also at the same time for Neil, just for, so everyone knows for his company, he's going, but he's also being cautious. So I don't want everyone to think that he's going balls of the walls because Neil is very, he's deliberate with how he does these. So there's a asterisk there. I am actually going really hard right now, but keep in mind, I have reserves. So I assumed a few years ago, not really a few years ago, I assumed pre COVID that things were going to get bad, but it just never ended up happening. COVID, the COVID for business. Month. Yeah. It was like a few months where businesses really struggled and then they started to boom back for less than six months. But the point I'm getting at is I saved for a rainy day because I assumed a rainy day is going to come. I'm assuming the rainy day is not over yet but I have enough reserves to really go hard and try to expand and build a bigger business. Yep. And I'm seeing the opportunity because things are cheaper right now. And I'm hoping if I go hard right now within two years, I'm assuming it's going to take a few years for us to really get out of this. And it could be sooner. I'm just imagining the worst case scenario where 2025 things start getting good and I'm willing to weather the storm. So there's a couple of lessons here and then we could work towards anyway, there's a couple of lessons here. So one is go hard, but be cautious, right? That's one piece of it. So there's the reserves, right? You want to make sure that you have a margin of safety. So Warren Buffett always talks about if a bridge can hold 30,000 pounds in weight, you want to make sure that maybe you're telling people that, oh, it can only hold 10,000, right? So you want to have that margin of safety there. The other thing to consider too, is that the job market, at least in the United States is still very strong right now. And we're still seeing strong wage inflation and the fed, these are the people that control the interest rates also known as our uncle Jerome Powell. So he <laughs> has the most important job right now. He can raise or he can decrease interest rates. And that basically decides how people, how the economy is going to go. Um, so keep that in mind too, right? They are trying to bring that down. Once wage inflation comes down, the job market tanks and or cools off a little bit, that's going to be an opportunity for you to continue to hire great talent. Because I will say like right now, I don't know about you, Neil, I think it's probably the same thing, but the amount of people that we're talking to, it's like way more, I would say way more talent is available. And these are great yes. people. They're very humble and they're not asking for Google level salaries, right? No. And I think the talent is the people being more flexible is going to even improve within the next six months, if I had a guess. Yep. And the final thing I'll say too, is being just be conservative, right? So be aggressive, but be conservative at the same time. There's always a balance to strike, right? I think it's interesting that you can follow Warren Buffett, you can follow Charlie Munger, and you can also follow Michael Burry from The Great Short. He's always calling like the next big crash, but I think he has, he always has interesting things to say. So follow macro. There's also one of our mutual friends, George Gammon. He has a great channel on macroeconomics and we talk about marketing here, but just keep in mind that the macro the macro le level stuff does actually affect business, which then affects marketing, right? So the better you get at that stuff or the more understand, the more you understand this stuff, the more prepared you're going to be to be prepared to unload when the time comes. Anything else, Neil? Make sure you rate review the podcast. Thank you for listening. All right. Goodbye.